In New York City, I'm Julie Hyman. That's Josh Lipton, and this is Yahoo Finance Live. Here's what we're watching this afternoon. The Dow pulling back from record highs as a batch of disappointing earnings weigh on the broader market. The S&P 500 and the NASDAQ are hovering near the flat line. Investors are waiting for more insight from corporate America, especially big tech. And after the close, all eyes are on Netflix, the streaming giant reporting just hours after announcing its biggest foray into live sports. We're going to be bringing you the results results and instant analysis to help you make investing decisions. Plus, the optimism over spot Bitcoin ETFs, it's fading fast. Bitcoin extending declines, now trading below $40,000. We're looking at the crypto trade and how stocks like Coinbase are caught in the crosshairs. Let's get you up to speed on the market action right now. As we talked about, really not seeing a lot of index level action in today's session, right? We do have consumer staples that are the best performing group today, real estate uh, doing the worst. But really what we have sort of switched into now is earnings mode for the major averages. So a lot more micro driven, individual company driven, individual fundamentals and earnings driven than we're seeing sort of index level moves. We'll see that come to the fore once again, once we start to kick back into what's the Fed gonna do next mo uh, mode. But for now, really focusing on those individual companies, what does that mean? means the Dow right now is off by about 100 points, hurt by some results there in that index. The S&P 500 doing better, up about a fifth of 1%, and the Nasdaq up a quarter of 1%. And you know, Julie, let's stick with those earnings let's results you mentioned. Let's mm -hmm. go there. We got a slew of earnings results before the bell today, giving us insight into how companies are feeling about the year ahead. Verizon beating the street with its revenue for the fourth quarter and blowing past expectations for its postpaid phone net additions. So Verizon reporting, Julie, good news if you were long the name. And I think the, the key metric here is really company's consumer group. It added 318,000 mobile subscribers in the quarter and that beat the street's expectations. Obviously Verizon competing in a very tough market here. You got AT&T, you got T-Mobile. Um, so this was a nice bogey to hit in addition because the net gain here comes after three down quarters. We know the company making changes you know in that in that business for example you know they talk about offering more flexible pricing plans and that and that seems to be having an impact looking ahead equally importantly here they're calling for adjusted profit in 2024 between 450 and 470 per share at the midpoint there that does just edge higher than when where consensus was at now when we see a day like this, a big pop, we want to remind people not everybody loves the name. So what are some reasons for skepticism? You, know, you see a 6% pop like that. You might want to think about, we should mention, you know, people who are kind of lukewarm. Moffitt Nathanson, for example, smart group of analysts, they cover Verizon. And they were arguing to their clients to, this morning, kind of reviewing their results. They were saying, listen, yes, it's cheap. They would argue, yes, it's got a meaty dividend yield, but bottom line, Verizon isn't growing. So for them, some good news, some bad news, it leaves them on the sidelines with a neutral um, at this point. Yeah, I mean, and I think what's also interesting here is the company's business group continues to do poorly. Sure. They just did a big yep. write down in that group and that continues to show some weakness here. This is also a stock, as we had pointed out yesterday, that has underperformed the S&P 500 over the past year. A lot of people own the telecoms because they pay high dividends, um, and that is something that uh, might be more attractive as rates pull back, but we haven't seen a big pullback in rates as of yet. So, uh, it, you know, a lot of this stuff does seem to be partially macro or partially sort of uh, Verizon specific. And then also we are talking about um, as we highlight some of the different earnings mm. reports, uh, we're looking at 3M as well. That company is stock. Yikes. You know, what we've, and I don't think we did this on purpose, by the way. Verizon's yeah. the best performer in the Dow. Yeah. 3M is the worst. Yeah, not so, so that's good. the push and pull that we're seeing today within the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And 3M is winning, so to speak, right mm. now. It is weighing more heavily on the Dow, and that's why we see the Dow underperforming today. Uh, the company's uh, forecast for profit and sales growth this year below estimates here. The company has done a lot of restructuring. It's cut a lot of jobs. It's tried to cut its expenses here. Where the concern seems to be is not with that side of the equation, but with end market demand here. A lot of analysts saying that we are seeing um, really mixed demand for their end markets. Industrial demand still not great. 
uh, retail spending slow, mm. according uh, to the CEO who talked to Bloomberg and said uh, that slumping electronics markets are stabilizing. That's on the plus side. But really, it's sort of lumpy, so to speak, in terms of end market demand. So if you're looking sort of across the industrial spectrum, if you will, maybe there's some read through there from 3M as well. And we're going to have to see what many of those other companies say. Yeah, with 3M, it's interesting too, because you mentioned that restructuring. And that was such a big part of the story last year because they they had this restructuring effort, they were cutting jobs, and that gave this kind of lift to, to results last year. Um, not helping right now, and the stock is down more than 20% near now over the past yeah. 12 months. So a lot of times when you see that, you would expect to see maybe some some financial analysts move in and upgrade, but actually, if you're sitting on the sidelines, then you are exactly where most analysts coming to this name say you should be. Yeah, exactly. All right, let's broaden it out here and talk more about earnings season writ large. Of course, it's starting to heat up this week. We've seen a few profit beats. <clears throat> Forward outlooks have been underwhelming, depending on who we're talking about. For more on earnings and if weak guidance could put a damper on the market, we want to welcome in David Sakara, Morningstar Chief U.S. Market Strategist. Hey, David. So, um, yeah. you know, so as we are partially through earnings season now, what is kind of your big picture read through here? Um, are we going to see sort of this continued pressure perhaps on stocks uh, from some of these numbers? You know, as you mentioned, I think it's going to be very idiosyncratic over the course of the next couple of weeks as earnings come out. Yeah, we do have GDP. We have PCE coming out this week. So I think that's going to drive some market volatility when those numbers come out as well. But I really think it's going to come down to individual stock selection. You know, you talked about Verizon, you know, earlier on the show. You know, again, that's a stock that we rated four stars, you know, coming into earnings. It was trading at a, almost a 30 percent discount in our view to our fair value. You know, pays a nice, healthy 6.8 percent dividend yield. So after earnings, you know, I know our analysts maintained you know, our $54 per share fair value estimate. You know, noted that this company is just executing on all fronts. But even more importantly, I think we have a differentiated investment thesis from the rest of the street at this point. And I think what we're really looking for, and we're actually starting to see some indications now that the wireless industry is going to actually start acting more like an oligopoly going forward. And as such, they're going to compete less on price. They're going to be able to start seeing their operating margins you know, rise over time. So I think that's a big reason why we think Verizon and AT&T as well are also very undervalued today. And, and what about, you know, it's interesting, David, I, so in, in terms of where you see opportunity here, um, talk about communications, you also like real estate, um, even with concern about urban office valuations, obviously that's get, that gets a lot of mm -hmm. attention and headlines, David. Yeah, so I think real estate's got a number of different things, you know, going for a lot of negative sentiment in the sector overall, and of course that being driven by valuations for urban office space. You know, an area I would still personally want to shy away from, but we see a lot of value in, you know, the real estate sector, you know, overall away from that. You know, a couple of different stock picks that we like, you know, one is going to be Realty Income Trust. That's the one we actually think is going to be the most correlated to interest rates, and we do expect interest rates to come down over the course of this year. We're looking for the 10-year to average about three and a half percent this year and fall even further to two and three quarter percent next year. So I think declining interest rates is going to give you know, a good tailwind you know, overall for the real estate sector. But a lot of those other you know, subsectors within real estates, like the healthcare area, we see a lot of interesting valuations today. David, is there any area that is not going to get a tailwind from those interest rates <laughs> coming in? Well, there's a couple of different areas of the market that we think have just run up you know, too far too fast, one of them being the technology sector overall. While it was one of the most undervalued sectors coming into 2023, Morningstar U.S. Technology Index was up, I believe, you know, 59% last year. At this point, it's trading about five to 10 percent, you know, overvalued in our view. So I actually see, you know, better opportunities, you know, to lock in some profits in the tech sector, you know, take those gains, put them into some of those areas that lagged last year that are still undervalued. It's interesting, Dave, when we talk about tech, you know, it wasn't so long ago, we would have plenty of uh, bulls come on the show and say, listen, part of the reason they were bullish about 2024 is because they expected to see this broadening in the, in the rally, David. But really, as we sit here in January, we're all just talking about big tech again, right? I mean, can the rally continue um, if it stays so focused or no, it does need to broaden? It does need to broaden. So when you look at the market, you know, last year, it was so concentrated, you know, in the magnificent seven stocks coming into last year, a lot of them were very undervalued. I mean, six of those seven stocks were either four or five star rated stocks in our view. At this point, it's exactly the opposite. Six of those seven stocks are actually now all three star stocks. 
They're all pretty close to fair value in our view. We actually think Apple has run up too high. That's now a two-star rated stock. So I think that story is behind us. That's a 2023 story. When we look in for value today, now broadly speaking, we think the market is pretty close to fair value. We're not seeing you know, a lot of upside away from just kind of you know, normalized returns going forward for the market itself. But when we break it down, we do see value in the value sector. So value stocks as a category do trade at a 10% discount to our fair value. I think that's a good area to overweight today. I'd probably underweight core stocks, maybe underweight uh, growth stocks slightly as well. But we also still really like you know, the small cap sector. You know, small cap stocks on average you know, trading at about 16% discount to our fair value. You know, on a historical basis, that's still you know, very undervalued. So I do think that those will end up catching up over the course of this year, especially more into the second half of the year. David, um, if I may to go back for, to tech for a moment, I mean, maybe you weren't mm -hmm. saying it, but man, if I had a dollar for every person in the last year who told <laughs> us the rally has to broaden to continue, and mm -hmm. it didn't broaden, and it continued. Right. So, <laughs> I, I, I mean, I understand what you're saying about the valuations being different now than they were then, but I, I just ha it hasn't come to pass. I'm just wondering what exactly is going to change. Like, are these tech companies going to disappoint with their earnings or what, you know, what will be the catalyst to, to have that flip? Yeah, I think it's a number of different things. I mean, from just that top-down macroeconomic outlook, yeah, we do expect that the economy is going to soften. We're looking for you know three sequential quarters this year of the rate of economic growth slowing, bottoming out in the third quarter. But we are in the soft landing camp. We're not looking for a recession. We think it's probably only a 25% probability. And even if we do have a recession, our U.S. economics team think it's going to be you know, relatively short and shallow at that point. We also do think interest rates will end up coming down over the course of this year as well. So between you know, the economy slowing but not going into recession, I think that's going to weigh on the tech sector. We're not going to see the same kind of earnings growth that some people might be you know, pricing in at this point. And with interest rates coming down, you know, that'll to make some of those dividend stocks, you know, looking better as well, which also will then help prop up the value category. David, thank you so much for joining the show today. Appreciate your time and those stock picks. Well, thank you. Let's check in on some trending tickers. We start here today with Alibaba getting a boost. The company's co-founder Jack Ma and chairman Joe Tsai reportedly buying over $200 million worth of Alibaba shares. That's according to the New York Times. So Alibaba, Julie, big names making some big purchases. We've got founder Jack Ma has been buying shares, bought $50 million worth of stock in the quarter. Of course, Ma is no longer um, executive chairman, but still a, an important shareholder over there. And then Chairman Joe Tsai has been buying too, and Bloomberg pointing out this is actually the first time his fund has purchased shares since at least the last quarter of 2017. Yeah, and it seems to represent a change here, right? Because even Ma himself has been sort of critical of Alibaba falling behind some of its competitors, Timu Group, Timu, uh, for example, owned by PDD. So there's, you know, um, so this seems to represent a, you know, a vote of confidence, if mm -hmm. you will, um, in uh, the company that he founded. And I think that's part of the reason why we are seeing uh, other investors follow him. The other reason, of course, is the stock has done so poorly, right? Yeah. Um, and so that's part of the reason. You could also, and we're going to talk about this more in the show, put it down perhaps somewhat to the report that China is considering some measures to prop up its stock market. For so sure. all of that combined, it seems, uh, helping with Alibaba. And to today. your point, we should know, I mean, the stock's popping today, but... Yikes. I mean, it's still down yeah. about 40 percent in the past 12 months. Yes, it is. Let's talk about another company we're watching today. That is Johnson & Johnson. It posted an earnings beat for the fourth quarter. Sales surging in its pharmaceutical and medical devices business. The shares, though, are down here 1.6 percent. It looks like uh, analysts and investors were zeroing in on the profit margins in its medical device unit. Um, the company put that down to, they had some costs related to an acquisition, they had commodity inflation, they called it an unfavorable product mix as well. Um, and so that's something that's been weighing on the stock. They also, you know, like so many of these gigantic drug makers, they're facing competitions in some of their top selling drugs. In this case, it's a, a drug called Stellara to treat psoriasis, which is gonna be facing competition in Europe specifically, and that that could weigh on sales in the second half of the year. Yeah, and another wrinkle here too, Julia, I think investors consider how certain treatments being selected for Medicare price negotiations. Right. And so you begin to think, if you're an investor, okay, kind of have to map out what exactly does that mean for sales? Looking ahead, stocks in the red today, and, and, and also over the past 12 months now. Right. 
Finally here, let's take a look at Procter & Gamble reportedly mixing uh, mixed quarterly results and slashing its annual profit forecast. However, the company reporting better than expected gross margins. So this one hits home, Julie Hyman. I mean, the, the, bo Literally? the, the bounty paper towels, the downy fabric softener. Yeah, those are, those are big in the Lipton household. Um, it looks like adjusted <laughs> earnings beat. Company also did raise its profit outlook, X some items. Um, and I guess, yes, there was okay, you know, a measure of organic sales under shot consensus, but investors looking, willing to look past that in today's trade. Yeah, lower commodity costs helping things. I was struck by um, these two numbers. Prices last quarter rose by 4%. It raised price, prices by 4%. And remember all of last year we were having the discussion where prices were going up, but volumes weren't necessarily going up. Well, guess what? In North America, volumes went up by 4% last quarter. In China, the company struggled a little bit more. But in North America, even though prices rose, people bought more stuff. They weren't sort of buying less because of those higher prices. I just thought that was an interesting Interesting item. You weren't you. You didn't go to the generic uh, paper towels. And no, no. You stick with the real softener. thing. Yeah, come on, bounty. I'm not, I'm not a fabric. Quick I'm not, paper upper. I'm not Quick a paper upper. Eh, I I I'm not a fabric softener <laughs> user in general. So much information to impart to viewers today. I got stock yeah, they, picks, fabric softeners. They gotta they gotta know. I, I also thought what what they said by the way just kind of regionally was interesting. Mm -hmm. um, how they talked about how the American consumer the American consumer the U S solid mm -hmm. continues to impress. These are the, the exact comments. On the other end, China. Uh, weak volumes, not surprising. I mean, we know, listen, yeah. the economy there is shaky, but just interestingly, kind of the regional differences they continue to point out Definitely. there. Definitely, and we're gonna talk more about China we in sure just are. a few. We're just getting started here on Yahoo Finance Live. Coming up, earnings season rolling on. Netflix is set to report after the close. That's gonna be a fun one. We'll break down the numbers from the streaming giant in the 4 p.m. hour. And Yahoo Finance's theme week, the AI revolution continues today. We're gonna speak to an expert to see what's next for AI this year and to break down some of the biggest risks surrounding the future of of tech. All that and more when Yahoo Finance returns.
All eyes on big tech as the magnificent seven stocks gear up to report their latest results with excitement around AI and caution on economic activity. What is the best way to play tech right here? Well, here to discuss is Dan Niles, Satori Fund founder and senior portfolio manager. Dan, it is great to have you on the show. And I want to dig right in, Dan, to the magnificent seven because, listen, there's a lot of viewers listening right now. They own these names, Dan. They're trying to figure out what to do with them. And you still see some opportunity, at least with some of those names. And so I want to dig into some of those picks. And one is Amazon, Dan, which has had a tremendous run. It's up about 60% over the past 12 months. But you see still better days ahead for Amazon. I'm guessing, Dan, in part, that must be because you look at AWS, the company's profit center, and you must see that accelerating over the next few quarters here? It's, it's actually not so much driven by AWS. I mean, I think AWS is an important piece because obviously so many investors are focused on it. And you saw the growth there slow from about... 40% year-over-year growth in the fourth quarter of 2021 to 12% in each of the last two quarters. And I do see that picking up a few points going forward because obviously AI is the theme, right? And everybody's trying to deploy it and figure out how to make it work. But the real driver in my mind is some of the other stuff that's going on because if you look at last quarter, they beat operating profits by 40%, 4 zero. And that was driven by the retail margins really starting to expand because don't forget, these guys put in a lot of capacity during COVID. Then as we came out of COVID, demand really slowed down for e-commerce. And so now as they're filling those uh, high overhead distribution hubs in, you're getting a ton of margin leverage. And then on January 29th, they're going to start showing ads to all the prime video users. And that's 60% operating margin business relative to high single digits for the overall company. So that's gonna be massively accretive. And so when I look at all of that, I can see EPS doubling by 2025 relative to where it is in 2023. And that's why I like the company a lot. Dan, I just wanna zero in on one thing that you talked about there, which is that this is a, an AI adjacent or non-AI story when you're talking about uh, Amazon. And I wonder if you broaden that out and look at the Magnificent Seven. I mean, there's gonna be, again, I'm sure, during all these earnings calls, a lot of AI talk, but that's not how they're making their money right now. And P.S., they're still making a lot of money from this other stuff, right? So how should investors be thinking about AI and then the rest of these businesses? Well, you have to remember the Magnificent Seven, it's easy to look at last year and go, wow, they were up you know, 111%. But don't forget, the year before that, the Magnificent Seven were down 46%. So you're exactly right, Julie, in that you need to kind of differentiate. And I think this earnings season, because all of these stocks had such a huge rally in November, December, and so far at the beginning of this year, you're going to see that start to break apart. And to some degree, you're seeing that during earnings season already. I mean, it's very early, but Logitech this morning is just getting absolutely destroyed after running up into their earnings. And so you're going to have to, I think, be very selective this year. That's why Amazon through AWS, as Josh asked about, they've got a legitimate AI play. They're one third of the outsourced cloud market. That's where a lot of people are deploying to test out their AI capabilities. We also like Meta quite a bit because the valuation is very compelling. You're talking about a company that's growing about 13% or so this year, trading at a 22 PE. And to put that in perspective, the S&P is trading at a 20 PE. So very small premium, and you've got an election coming up, which is going to happen regardless of whether we get a recession or not at the end of this year. And they're using AI to help place ads, to monetize those ads better, and to recommend videos to you. And so they're seeing really good engagement there. And so that's why for us, we like those names. You, you look at an Apple, on the other hand, and you go, wait a minute, I'm supposed to pay almost 30 times for a company that's growing mid single digits. You know, I know retail investors love this name and you know, everybody has an iPhone. So it's very easy to own, but on a risk reward basis, they've had negative year over year revenue growth for four quarters. So I think you need to balance out where are you getting paid to take risk in terms of the multiple being low enough and there being enough upside where things can work out. And Apple, for its part, doesn't have an AI play, really. And hopefully they'll add that to the phones you know, later this year. But for right now, they're not an AI play, but they're being valued like them. So I think selectivity is key going into this earnings season. 
You know, Dan, another big theme during this earnings season we're going to hear a lot about is China. I'm interested if you see opportunity there, you know, if there's if there's names you would be interested in committing ca- capital to at this point. We've had some strategists come on the show, Dan, and I'll be honest, they tell us at this point they don't think China is investable. What do you think? Well, that's great to hear because when I hear something's not investable, I go, well, is it going to zero? So if your view is China's economy is going to zero, then it's not investable. But I look at it differently in that I go, when are you getting paid to take the risk? So if you look at China's version of the Magnificent Seven called BAT, which is Baidu, Alibaba, and Tencent, China went in after these companies, really starting with the blocking of the Ant Financial IPO by Alibaba in November of 2020. And if you look at how those three stocks have done over the past three years, 21, 22, 23, the revenues for all those three names went up 33%, but the stocks went down 53%, and you've got those three trading at a gap PE of 12 times. Now, you compare that against the Magnificent Seven, revenues were up 54% over those three years, but the stocks are up 69%, and you're paying a 34 PE for it. So with these China stocks, all you need is for the government to decide you know what, we're going to go from aggressive persecution to vigilant monitoring. And you can see massive multiple expansion. Because don't forget, last year with the Magnificent Seven, for, for a couple of those names, Apple's a great example. Their EPS that they're about to report for the December quarter in a couple of weeks is actually down 10% from where it was 12 months ago. The stock was up 45% plus last year. Tesla, it's a similar situation where EPS for the December quarter that they're about to report is down 50% from where it was a year ago, and the stock doubled last year. So a lot of stock movement is multiple related. And at a 12 PE for the three of the most recognizable names in China, and you look at Alibaba in particular, and you go, wow, at the lows yesterday, about 50% of the market cap was sitting in cash. You go, that's pretty compelling, especially when they're throwing off enough free cash flow to buy the entire company back in about four years if they use the cash and then use the free cash flow. So to me, that news of Jack Ma and uh, you know the chairman also buying shares, you only buy shares for one reason. You think the stock's going to go up and they probably have a better view of whatever the China leadership is thinking than anybody else. And at this PE level, and I hear a lot of people saying it's uninvestable, that makes me pretty interested in terms of buying it. And the analogy I would draw is it's like buying Facebook, you know, a year and change ago. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we were on the media saying, look, at ni- low 90s, this makes a lot of sense. And the stock has more than doubled from those levels because it was at such an attractive valuation. And, the, and at the end of the day, the company was still growing. A true contrarian, Dan Niles. Thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, Dan was just talking about the China investing case. And in fact, China stocks are higher today. Authorities reportedly considering a package of different measures to stabilize the slumping economy and the market specifically. Policymakers, according to Bloomberg, are seeking about $278 billion to support the market. And that's as we see a huge gap in between the Chinese markets and the U.S. markets. Let's bring in Yahoo Finance's Jared Blickery. Some really interesting milestones that we have seen over the past couple of days, yes. India surpassing Hong Kong, for example, in market size, and that gap between the U.S. and China widening. Yeah, and I think it's also instructive just to think about the U.S. is at record highs in just about all our major indices. China is flirting with global financial cl- uh, crisis lows, depending on which index you look at. But uh, I have the Wi-Fi interactive here, so let's just take a look at some of the visuals here. Um, now, here is the uh, world map. Here's what's happening today. In Hong Kong, we have 2.6%. That's what happened today. But let me show you what it looks like over the last three years. It's basically from the mm. upper left to the lower right. Down that This market has been cut in half. And this is actually worse off than the mainland shares. Uh, here's the Shanghai Composite. It's down 23%. 
over a similar period of time. And just taking a look at inside the global indices, what has happened this year, year to date? There's a bunch of funny symbols on here. These are all indices, but I'm gonna make this real simple. In the upper left, we have the Nikkei 225, that's up 9%, followed by the NASDAQ 100, up 3%. Then we got some other indices. At the very bottom, it's mainly China, and also Korea for that matter, which is highly levered to China. So the Hang Seng down 9.9%, the Chinese, uh, uh, the Shanghai Composite down 7%. And a lot of this has to do with uh, the other measures that the, that the Chinese government has had to put in place, which simply haven't worked. Uh, Julie, you mentioned this new facility. This is going to be about $278 billion or $2 trillion uh, yuan, and it's offshore. So they're going to be funneling this money through, through Hong Kong. But we've seen this chart that I'm showing right now. This is social financing. This is what the Chinese government calls stimulus going back 20 years. This is from the lower left to the upper right but it just has not had the effect it's had historically recently. Right, and there is some skepticism about this report today that it's even going to, even though, yes, we did see a pop in, in those Chinese stocks, yes. there seems to be some skepticism out there that even if they do enact this stimulus, that it's not going to be sustainable. Yes, I, I think we've seen a lot of this before. This probably falls in the bucket of half measures, not as bad as the quarter measures that were introduced before. Um, I'm not going to sneeze at two trillion yuan. And there's also a domestic fund that's going to be added to it. That should be worth about 300 yuan. But look, we're talking about $300 billion. All that was able to do was goose the Hang Seng by two or 3%. Right. That is not a lot. And so I think the, the uh, people are dubious that this is going to have any effect. Now, the danger is that all of this spending, which is apparently for naught, which is sending bad money after, or good money after bad money. Let's go back to the Wi-Fi Interactive. I want to show you their budget deficit relative to GDP. This goes back 10 years to 2013, goes through 2023. 3% uh, was the theoretical cap that has now been breached twice to the upside. It's estimated it's going to go up to 5% this year. At that point, the Chinese government has to worry about losing control of their currency and capital outflows. So they're playing this dangerous game of stimulus versus capital outflows, and so far they've been losing. Yeah. It's interesting watching Chinese authorities kind of pull these levers, the financial levers, but also yeah. the rhetoric, watching them sort of, they come to the U.S., right? They go to yeah. Davos, kind of trying to pound the table, saying we're open for business. See how investors react, though. It'll be interesting. Yeah. Jared, thanks so much. Appreciate right. it. Coming up, the latest interview as part of our theme week, the AI revolution. We speak with an expert to discuss what's next for artificial intelligence. Stick around. More Yahoo Finance after this.
You know, I think AI has to be almost a human right to have access to, hum to, to AI, and we need the governance mm -hmm. around AI. Generative AI changes everything. It fundamentally changes the nature of the human computer interface. Uh, as it relates to enterprise application software, and this is big. And Gen AI is the moment in which the CEOs are no longer thinking about investing. They know they have to invest because if they don't, and their competitor does, they may not be around too long. Every company can benefit from this next generation of technology. I think you can look at and you know look at every industry, and Gen AI has applicability. As you can tell, generative AI was center stage last week at the World Economic Forum in Davos. Now leaders must focus on turning the hype and investment from 2023 into actual value, all while governments examine just how much regulation is needed for the new technology. Here to discuss where AI goes from here as part of Yahoo Finance's theme week, the AI revolution, we welcome in Tom Davenport, President's Distinguished Professor of Information Technology and Management at Babson College. Thanks so much for being here, Tom. So. I would start with how this all becomes real. A lot of the talk that we heard last week was a lot of big talk about how much Gen AI is going to play into these businesses. But I'm looking at sort of actual deployment and monetization. Where are we in that cycle and how are we going to see that play out? Well, that's the right place to be looking. And you wouldn't see very much if you're looking in that direction. <laughs> Um, I did a survey at the end of last year sponsored by Amazon Web Services, and it's, it suggested 6% of companies have any production deployment of generative AI. So lots of talk, but not much action yet. And when you when you survey these these chief data officers, Tom, these CDOs, and they talk about AI, granted, it you know obviously as you said it's early it's early days, early beginnings here. But what are kind of the the benefits, the potential priorities, but also the roadblocks they they call out to you? Well, the I think the um, primary activity now is in individual experimentation and. That's going to be hard to measure the benefits, and I think they're not um, ultimately going to be terribly large. Um, if you look at um, use cases like um, customer operations, um, call centers, contact centers, I think there is likely to be a substantial amount of value. Um, uh, Automated code generation, I think, is going to yield a lot of value, although that's going to take some time, I think, to really settle into development processes. Um, as you can see on the chart, R&D and um, uh, <laughs> none of the above are pretty <laughs> low level. So a lot of potential opportunity. The biggest, I think, barrier now is in the data and how organizations get their data ready for generative AI. And how do they do that, Tom? How do they get good data sets? Um, because, you know, there's only, I know there's an enormous quantity of data being generated every second, but is it the right kind of data on the right kind of information? Well, most organizations these days are interested in how do I train a generative AI model to um, deal with their own data and their own content. And unfortunately, they haven't really curated or managed that terribly well over time. So the organizations that did this successfully early on, companies like Morgan Stanley, they have a, a small army of people curating their investment reports and um, making sure they're accurate and up to date and not overlapping with other investment reports because generative AI, as we know, if fed poor quality information is going to give poor quality outcomes. As you talk to these folks, Tom, across different companies, you, know, you survey these, these chief data officers, so they're experimenting, at least experimenting with the technology. It's against the backdrop, Tom, of you know, regulation. I'm curious how you see kind of regulation of this technology kind of playing out, at least here in the US. And, and do, you, do you believe, Tom, that American regulators and lawmakers have the background, the experience, frankly, the tech chops to regulate AI responsibly and effectively? Uh, what do you think? <laughs> I think we all know that they don't. Um, and I've seen the hearings, Tom. This is why I'm asking, because you watch these hearings, the tech execs get dragged up before Congress. It kind of often becomes sort of embarrassing for, frankly, everybody that's involved. 
Yeah, I think that's mostly a show. You know, Congress can't pass a budget, so they're not going to be able to pass meaningful AI legislation. I think the only good news for those people who want more um, regulation, and I am among them, is that I think it's likely that some aspects of the AI Act in um, the EU will be adopted by companies globally. You know, large companies have to do business in the EU no matter where they're based. And so I think many of them will um, adopt some of the, the AI Act regulations. But, you know, there's also the issue of how do we enforce it? There was an interesting um, report in the Wall Street Journal this morning suggesting that, you know, one of the few pieces of meaningful legislation we have in the U.S. comes out of New York. It's called Local Law 144 that regulates the use of AI in recruiting and hiring. And um, this um, regulation is basically not being enforced at all. Um, uh, something like 18 out of 400 companies even did any sort of audit at all on it. So um, we have to put a regulatory infrastructure in place in addition to just passing the laws if we're going to be successful with it. Well, and Tom, what do you think the urgency level is here on this? Because, I, you know, we can sort of joke about Congress not really being up to the task, but you know, I take the example of social media, which was not regulated um, and exploded. And I think one could argue there have been pretty darn negative consequences from the lack of proper regulation there. So how do you get this done? How do you light a fire? How do you make sure it's done properly? Um, you know, how do you transform the current operations of the U.S. government? <laughs> you know, that's an issue that we're all wrestling with every day. Um, as I say, I don't see that happening at a federal level, and it'll, I think, be somewhat chaotic if individual states and even cities start to pass AI legislation. So I kind of think um, regulation in the United States is a lost cause, but I do think there are some potentials for the AI Act having an influence on, on U.S.-based companies. Tom, it's a big, important topic. Thank you so much for joining the show today and helping us walk through it. My pleasure, thanks. Meanwhile, Netflix making a long-term deal to bring WWE's flagship program, Raw, to the streaming service. This marks a major programming shift for Raw as it gears up to leave linear television for the first time. Yahoo Finance's Alexandra Canals here with the details, Ali. Hi, and you know what guys, this made me think about all of the streaming services out there, big and small, that are competing for these sports rights. And this is something that Netflix has said over the past year or so, they're not really interested in doing. They don't want to go too deep into sports. Now, you could argue WWE, it's more live sports entertainment, perhaps. And if you look is at the- Is it sports, Allie? Is that, it sports? That is the big question I, here. I like, the, I like yeah. that framing, live sports entertainment. entertainment. Yes, yeah. and that's what analysts have really said. We haven't quite seen Netflix Netflix dive into the yeah. live sports component just yet. And if you take a look at a company like Amazon, I mean, they shelled out over $100 billion for their deal with the NFL. Comcast Peacock paid $110 million for one playoff game for the NFL. So this is serious money that we're talking here. And Netflix has historically said, uh, historically, I'm saying in the past year or so, and sports rights have really become more of an opportunity here, that they're not ready to spend that kind of money just yet. Now, across Wall Street, Street, across the industry, they say they're going to have to at some point. I mean, sports is the last frontier for streaming. And what does that mean for the cable bundle? The cable bundle, I mean, it's going to be dead. I think in the next 10 years, we're not going to see cable coming around much more because sports is really the one thing that's hooking consumers, that's hooking viewers to continue to pay for those types of packages. If you can get that on streaming, why would you continue to pay for cable? So that's something that I think is going to be a major shift in the industry moving yeah. forward. Whether it's sports is interesting. And I'm not trying yeah. to insult WWE. And I got producers in my well, control room, that's a big huge question. fans. I would never disrespect the athletes who are mm -hmm. that much bigger. Um, but it's sort of like, to, when I think about WWE, I think like live, unscripted kind of storytelling. And some even say right. it is scripted. I mean, like, yeah. listen, yeah. If, if Is It Cake is already on Netflix, you could argue they're already in the live sports entertainment business. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Like, they have all this competition show 
those, that's right? True. Isn't that the kind of the same thing? Competition? They have the Squid Game competition. That feels like game? a very elastic definition <laughs> of sports at that point. I gotta tell you, I don't think that's what people are thinking when they think sports and Netflix. I don't think that's where they're going. The question is whether this is like sure. paving the way to real sports. I, I, I don't know it. if WWE. I, I, I do it. think it is the first step for Netflix to really start to embrace. I don't, I hesitate to say real sports, but you know, I think like NFL, MLB, those types of things, but we'll see if they'll get there. Yeah. We'll yeah. see. All right, thank Allie, you, thank Allie. you. Appreciate it. Well, coming up, uh, DR Horton stock is falling after posting mixed first quarter results. We're going to break down those numbers and take a look at the home building sector when we come back. Bitcoin extending declines now trading near $39,000. The optimism over spot Bitcoin ETFs evaporating and the declines are also hitting crypto related stocks, including Coinbase. Joining us now is Owen Lau, Oppenheimer Executive Director and Senior Analyst. Owen, it's good to see you. So some of your colleagues, Owen, uh, making headlines today, they're getting, you know, not getting kind of pessimistic, skeptical on Coinbase, and their worry here is they're watching Bitcoin. Uh, they watch these Bitcoin spot ETFs, Owen. Maybe a kind of sell the news event. Do you share that that caution here, Owen? I think first. So first of all, thank you for having me. Um, I think in the near term, the stock could be volatile because think about that. If you go back to Coinbase, the stock was up four hundred percent in twenty twenty three. And Bitcoin price was also up a lot. And there was a sell the news event happening after the spot Bitcoin ETF approval. 
I do think that in the near term, there may be some downward momentum on Bitcoin until the next catalyst. So I would say near term, you you, you probably see the, the stock to be pretty uh, volatile for Coinbase. Owen, is the Bitcoin price the most important factor for Coinbase's stock price? I would say this is one of the most important factors for now. The other important factor is they are going on a lawsuit with the SEC. So there's still a regulatory overhang. We still don't have a clear regulations in the United States right now, even though there are more clarity outside of the United States. So I would call Bitcoin price, the SEC lawsuit, and also the um, I think the overall health of the industry are all important factors for Coinbase. And, and Owen, I'm also interested when you talk about Coinbase, the business, um, and you look at non-trading revenue, Owen, what, what percentage is, uh, of that is now the total? And how do you see that sort of evolving from, he from here? Because obviously they, they put a lot of emphasis and priority in diversifying the business, right? Yeah, at the end of the third quarter, I would say around 50%, half of the revenue came from non-trading. And those revenue came from interest income and also blockchain uh, income, which is the revenue they got from the USDC stablecoin. They have a revenue sharing agreement with, with Circle. And then the other smaller revenue items are uh, the staking uh, revenue and also custody revenue. So you're right that Coinbase has been making a lot of effort to diversify away from, from just trading. So that's why Bitcoin is important, but not the, I, I wouldn't say it's like only one Bitcoin, like only Bitcoin is the uh, like predominant factor. Um, and then when we look at the Bitcoin ETFs as well, right, um, there was a lot of debate sort of ahead of time as to whether this was going to be a boon or neutral or even negative for Coinbase. So now that the introduction has come and gone, what do you think? So when we look at the fourth quarter trading volume, so when we bake in a lot of the optimism of Bitcoin, spot Bitcoin ETF approval, there are two key things that I think not many people talk about. Number one, Bitcoin price went up a lot. And Coinbase generate revenue based part of part on the price of Bitcoin. The second point was about higher trading volume. So what that means is uh, this Bitcoin uh, ETF can bring in new investors. It support higher prices. It also support higher trading volume that actually benefit Coinbase longer term. So to me, I think it's a net positive for Coinbase longer term because it bring in new investors. What about the risk, Owen, uh, to the extent maybe you even see it as a risk, that investors now say, you know what, um, I want exposure to Bitcoin and I'm going to do it through a spot Bitcoin ETF where, you know, there's been kind of this race to the bottom on fees anyway. I'll go yep. that way rather than buy Bitcoin on, on the Coinbase platform. That's a very good point. So we expect some investors, in particular, some institutional investors would move away from Coinbase to ETF because of the lower fee you just talked about. But think about that, Spot Bitcoin ETF, it's just one use case, which is the speculation use case. If you trade on Coinbase, there are 240 other tokens that you can engage with, not just Bitcoin. And also, you can also engage with other use cases like DeFi and Web3. So to me, what I believe is, I believe a vast majority of customers would stay with Coinbase because of the access to Web3 and DeFi and some other use cases. Owen, good to catch up with you. Thanks a lot. Appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Shares of DR Horton down today following a mixed earnings report. And on the call, the company announcing they're sticking to their incentive strategy of offering mortgage rate buy downs despite rates slowly decreasing. For more, Danny Romero of Yahoo Finance joining us right here. So explain explain this situation to me, this, these uh, buy downs that they're doing. Yeah, DR Horton really, the, the weaker results really does highlight the big divide among home builders right now on whether or not to keep incentives where they're at, keep going with them, or pull back as mortgage rates are moving down lower. DR Horton made it very clear that they are, are sticking to their plan and they are not pulling back on incentives, even if mortgage rates do come down. And we have seen that mortgage rates have come down uh, from their highs last year. They're no longer hovering around 
that 8% or even 7%. They're now hanging around 6 the 6% range, which brings up the big Wall Street debate. If mortgage rates do come down, what does that mean for home builder incentives? You know, incentives have been such a big game changer for these home builders as the resale market has slumped last year. And, you know, if they do pull back, what does that mean for demand, foot traffic, all those different things? Obviously, it would be a positive to their gross margins because that's been a bit of a squeeze uh, these quarters. But by contrast, one home builder did come up front, KB Home. He, uh, that home builder said that they are going to pull back on incentives this year. Will they actually execute it? We'll have to wait and see. But the big bottom line, the, the bottom line is that investors are not as optimistic that the Fed will cut interest rates in March. And we have, uh, we have seen those long-term rates rise, which do feed into mortgage rates. So that does leave uncertainty on whether or not the home builders will be able to accommodate the, uh, these, these buyers and where will mortgage rates even land. Hmm. All right, Danny, important one. Thank you for bringing it to us. Appreciate it. Coming up, closing bell on Wall Street. We're checking in on the latest market moves and the top trending tickers. Stay tuned. the closing bell on Wall Street. It is Tuesday, January 23rd, and we had a mix closed for the major averages. The Dow finishing off by about 96 points. The S&P up uh, about a third of 1%. The Nasdaq about four tenths of 1%. Guess what? That means new records for the S&P 500. Again, a closing record, as well as for the Nasdaq 
100 here uh, for those major averages, Josh. All right, the Dow pulling back from its record high, but the S&P 500 notching another new high. Jared Blickery here with the recap. Jared. That's right. Small caps taking a little bit of a back seat today, but uh, let's get into some of the record closing highs for individual stocks. And we can see a couple of new faces we haven't seen in a few weeks. Berkshire Hathaway, forget the Magnificent Seven, that would maybe be the Magnificent Eight there. Uh, that's up 1.15% for the day. Also, Ross Stores, uh, that's up about half a percent. And we haven't had a new high in Ross Stores since the very beginning of the year. Another one for NVIDIA, another one for Meta, another one for Broadcom and Visa, Merck. We've been seeing these guys populate this screen for a number of days. And let's dive into the sector action where we see staples, consumer staples, boring staples in the pull position up 1.1%. Well, that's a Procter & Gamble story. Uh, XLC is communication services. We had Verizon reporting earnings this morning, but they also have Meta and Alphabet in there that, pro that closed positively. So that's giving that sector a boost, almost up 1%. And then leadership falls off about halfway from there to XLK, and that's tech. And let's just dive into the NASDAQ 100. You can see the mega caps, the left end, the end left end of the screen here. That is all green, although some of the smaller issues, as we've been seeing, uh, struggling to keep up. And real quickly, if I sort by performance, let's just take a look at some of the losers here. Datadog down almost 3%. Looks like Micron down 2%. Align Technologies 1.91%. And it goes down the line. And let's just take a look at some of our leaders here. I have a bunch of ETFs that I like to look at just to kind of gauge the sentiment of the market. Last hour, I was talking about the strength in Chinese stocks today, and KWeb is up 5% on potential new stimulus measures. I'm going to get to that heat map in a second. That looks pretty juicy. TAN, solar energy, which has gotten decimated over the last few sessions, that is up 3%. And then home builders. This was recently at re record highs, but it is down 3% today. Also, it looks like regional banks and Bitcoin, crypto in general, just taking some small hits today. And let's take a look at those Chinese shares. You can see Alibaba up almost 8%, Baidu up over 7 so is JD.com. So these are some of the best days in a long time for Chinese stocks. Is it the uh, turn that everybody's been waiting for? I would not hold my breath, but anything's possible. And let's look at, look, uh, excuse me, let's take a look inside the disruption sector of the U.S. economy, of the U.S. stock market. Aside from Coinbase, I was noting that we were having some weakness in crypto today, Coinbase down 3%. But for the most part, some of the larger issues here, we are seeing strength. Roku up 2.84%. Haven't talked about that one in a while. And let's get to uh, some, some of the value sectors. Here's energy. Now, not the best day for energy, but we do see ExxonMobil up 1.13%. Guys. Thanks so much. Appreciate it, Jared. We have Netflix numbers just coming out here and a mixed picture overall, but on balance positive for Netflix, whose shares are up to 7% here uh, in the after hour session. Fourth quarter earnings per share coming in at $2.11. That's actually a miss versus the $2.19 that analysts were estimating. Revenue, however, at $8.83 billion is above estimates. And let me give you the two most important numbers, it seems here. First of all, how many subscribers did they add? Paid subscribers on a net basis up 13.12 million. That is much higher than the just around 9 million that was estimated. So big, I, I, I wouldn't say blowout, but uh, almost a blowout here in, this, uh, in the paid subscriber additions here. The other thing I'm zeroing in on here is the first quarter earnings per share forecast of $4.49. 409 is what analysts had been predicting. The revenue number for the first quarter, the revenue forecast from Netflix is more sort of in line to slightly below what analysts are estimating, but that earnings per share number is a pretty big uh, beat vis-a-vis -vis what analysts were looking for. Yeah, I mean, for sure, you look at the initial reaction here, at least. Investors like this report. We are popping 5% here in the after hours. I think, Julie, you call that exactly the right metrics. I'll be really interested, too, just to get more color on a couple key points. One, the ad tier. We kind of numbers they're seeing there. We got a, a, an update recently, but how they see that evolving here, what kind of growth they expect in the quarter uh, quarters ahead. And also, of course, we were talking about Ali Canal, the WWE deal, that's going to come up. Is that a signal that Netflix is going to get more aggressive in traditional sports like Prime, like, like Peacock? And if so, does that change how much um, spending they'll do, at least how much investors and the street think they're going to be spending? Yeah, a couple of things stand out to me in the shareholder letter, which always has lots of good nuggets here. The company talks about 
getting that ad tier more sustainable, bigger, obviously, yep. from a low base. One of the other interesting things they talk about are the changes that have been coming. Already that entertainment, as they say, is a fast-changing industry, but uh, that there are going to be more changes, that there's going to be more consolidation uh, among companies with large and declining linear networks, they say. Netflix says in this, in this uh, letter, we're not interested in acquiring linear assets nor do we believe that further M&A among traditional entertainment companies will materially change the competitive environment, given that there's already been a lot of consolidation. So I thought well, that was sort of interesting here. Not that anybody thought that they were buying a linear no, asset. No, but you know what? It, but it is interesting to hear One thing say you that. do hear about is that, you know, the kind of moves they've made in gaming, they've been at that for a while now, and people are interested in how that, that evolves. So maybe they're not interested in kind of traditional linear assets, but you have heard talk from analysts, could they make a move in gaming? You know, yeah. something in that space would be interesting as, as investors wait to see how the gaming strategy evolves and how exactly they're going to make money off it. Yes, most definitely. All right, let's get some more perspective on all. All of this for a closer look at Netflix's fourth quarter results in that first quarter forecast. We've got Jamie Lumley, Third Bridge Group sector analyst. Good to see you, Jamie. So, I mean, again, I I sort of thought that that subscriber ad was a wow. I don't know if it was a wow for you, but tell me what you thought of the numbers. So certainly the first number everyone looks at is the subscriber growth when we're talking about Netflix. And I think when we look at that 13 million, it certainly is large. It's uh, one of the strongest quarters they've had in years. Uh, but there are also a couple of things which uh, were indicators for why Netflix might be able to close out 2023 with momentum. They had the crackdown on password sharing, the page sharing launch, the ongoing scale of the ad tier. And what we've been hearing from our experts here at Third Bridge was that they were barely scratching the surface for the uh, subscribers they could tap into with that crackdown on password sharing. So certainly 13 million is an impressive number. It will be really interesting to see what kind of momentum the company can uh, continue with going forward. And Jamie, with the stock up here in the after hours, more than four and a half percent. Interesting to also get your, your perspective, and I'm just talking to Julie about this too. Just on the ad tier, Jamie, how you think about that? How you see the ad tier kind of evolving from here? So the ad tier is definitely really interesting because it's a bit of a mixed story so far. When Netflix first launched the ad tier at the end of 2022, there were very lofty goals, hoping for 40 million monthly active users by the end of 23. And by the most recent numbers, the company announced they had 23 million earlier this year. Uh, it has seen growth, but it's still a little bit behind expectations. What we've been hearing is that there might have been a slight uh, misjudgment of how open consumers are to advertising. But overall, as we look around the industry at how expensive non-ad supported tiers are getting, seeing price increases from almost all the players, Disney, Warner Brothers Discovery, and Netflix over the last year, ad tiers could become increasingly attractive. And as the content uh, you know that's there is the same as on premium tiers, Increasingly, users might look to that if they're looking for more discount options. Jamie, I'm curious, and I'm, I'm looking, among other things, at the operating margin numbers here, uh, which we did see uh, dip a little bit sequentially in the fourth quarter. Uh, how's your satisfaction level with the spend, the particularly the content spend that we're seeing from Netflix at this point? Well, if we think about content spend, 2023 was a bit of an anomaly right. as there was both this tempering of overall CapEx levels for content spend as the industry as a whole starts to grapple more and more with uh, focusing on profitability and seeing the ROI on content spends. And then also with that as a backdrop, seeing the actors and writer strikes stop Hollywood for months. We saw this in the Q3 cash flow for Netflix, the billion uh, additional uh, cash flow as a result of the lack of content spends, and also some of that trailing into the fourth quarter. So as we think about where they are today, there are still definitely leaps and bounds above the other streaming uh, competitors out there. But the numbers they have are a little bit impacted by these other factors in 2023 and will definitely um, shift as we go into 2024 and think about what this company can achieve this year. And Jamie, I'm interested to get your, your take too on this WWE deal, Jamie, and, and whether you see that as a signal that yes, Netflix is ready here to get more aggressive in traditional sports like Prime, like Peacock, or no, this really isn't sports, this is more like live entertainment. 
Well, whether you classify WWE as real sports is definitely a uh, fiery issue. But if we think about what Netflix's ambitions here, I think the bigger focus is on live entertainment. And definitely Netflix has increased its uh, you know, ambitions for the space. Last year, we saw a couple of events um, from live comedy specials to Love is Blind reunion uh, to the golf tour last fall. Now we have tennis this year. And coming in January 2025, the WWE it definitely shows that Netflix wants to increase the live programming that it has. This, just circling back to the ad tier, uh, is one thing which advertisers definitely like. Live programming is definitely a boon. Uh, and it's also a way to diversify that content base. You know, live programming, uh, particularly something like the WWE, is not something Netflix has. It could broaden its appeal and really bring a dedicated uh, subscriber base to the platform. Now, what's next for them? This deal is $5 billion over 10 years for the WWE. That's definitely a lot of money. Whether they're also willing to spend at such levels for sports rights is still a question to be answered. Jamie, um, what are you worried about when it comes to Netflix? Or are, then, or are there any numbers in this report that you think are of concern? Well, one of the things which, if we circle or uh, turn back uh, time a little bit and think back to 2022, there were some stops and starts with Netflix subscriber numbers. It cannot grow forever. There are only so many people out there. Uh, so the question, of course, is ongoing sustained engagement with consumers, managing churn numbers, and continuing to find new ways to reach audiences. So if we think about some of the newer initiatives, for Netflix, there's a live programming, a new way to engage people. There is also gaming. Is this going to be a big uh, part for the company? How invested are they going to be in this segment? So far, they've made a few investments here and there, picking up a few small game studios, but they've shied away from any major M&A deals. So how invested they get in one of those areas could definitely determine some of the longer term uh, potential for ongoing uh, engagement. The other thing is just content costs. It's still expensive. This is something Netflix is fighting with and something all the other studios are dealing with. So seeing how cost trend going forward is also another factor to keep in mind. And, and Jamie, I just want to get, get you out of here on, on a topic you just touched on there, gaming, because it's another big focus for the street. I'm just, listen, they've been at it for some time, Jamie. So when you look at that business though, what do you think they'll do? I mean, do you think they're going to come up with new ways to monetize that business, make money on it? Do you think they're going to pull the trigger on some M&A? So we've been hearing a few things on this topic. First, on the M&A front, the experts that we speak to, by and large, think that Netflix will more likely than not uh, continue on this incremental growth, not uh, want to make any big uh, splashes and potentially have missteps to define the best way to combine their IP, some of the franchises they've been able to build uh, with a new way to engage consumers. So if we look at where they are right now, it's still a very small portion of Netflix's base which engages with gaming, but it is growing. 2023 saw over 100% growth uh, in downloads and engagement with their apps. So there's definitely some momentum being built there. It's just how they want to approach uh, sustaining this, which is the big question. When it comes to larger M&A, it could help them cement this, find a good way to monetize their IP in a way which Warner Brothers Discovery or Disney has in turning some of their biggest franchises into big hit games. Uh, but Netflix is still trying to figure out what makes the most sense for them to continue that growth going. Squid Game game, maybe. I don't know. Jamie Lumley, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Coming up, we're checking in on some of today's top trending tickers to see how they closed out the day. Stay tuned.
shares of Boeing closed near the lows of the day. The decline's coming after NBC promoted an interview with the Alaska Airlines CEO where he says the airline found, quote, many loose bolts on its MAX 9 planes after that door panel blew off mid-flight. Uh, the CEO of Alaska Airlines, Ben Minicucci, uh, also says uh, that he was angry about it. And this, of course, follows on the heels of reports over Scott Kirby making comments of, of United Airlines that he was angry about the situation as well. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm struck by these comments from the Alaska Airlines CEO. Um, they're very strong and he's clearly very upset when he says, I'm more than frustrated and disappointed. I am angry. This happened to Alaska Airlines, it happened to our guests, and it ha happened to our people. As you noted, Julie, we just had these reports of United Airlines CEO Scott Kirby um, reportedly also very upset um, about the quality issues at Boeing. Uh, these are two big customers who are not happy at all. And I was also just about future plans for the company. This struck me as well that um, kind of the United Airlines Scott Kirby in a separate interview on another network today saying they're now kind of thinking through the future for their fleet without the Boeing 737 MAX 10. That's the new, newer v version of the popular jet. So that fallout just continuing here and, and it leaves Boeing investors with a lot of questions. Well, and the question that I still haven't gotten answered, we talked a little bit about it with Mike Boyd the other day, is there are only two plane makers that service these commercial um, airlines and the other one's Airbus and it's not like it has the capacity to churn out a lot more planes than it is already making so you know if these companies are angry with Boeing what's the recourse what does Boeing do what you know do they cancel those orders do they get rebates what you know what happens in this situation I just I haven't heard a good answer to that yet. No, we haven't. And we also, I mean, at this point, we also were asking analysts no clear timeline, of course, right. at this yeah. point, when these grounded jets could possibly get back in the air either. We don't have yeah. that at this point. Yeah. All right, one well, we'll keep following for sure. Turning to some trending tickers, meanwhile, let's look at shares of Lockheed Martin suffering the worst one day drop in more than four months today. It's after the defense company warned of a possible delivery delay. So that that was the the, the issue here um, for Lockheed Martin, obviously the big weapons maker. It sounds like these delays, Julie, to F-35 fighter jets, mm -hmm that deliveries could now, we're seeing a good slip into Q3, and that's later than first estimated. And the wait here, from what I understand, is for this upgraded software, at least according to reports I was reading, which will allow the jets to carry more precise weapons, among other advantages. Um, as for earnings, Q4 earnings actually beat consensus, but th that's the headline that, that's shaking investors. Yeah, and it seems to be linked to that is the outlook overall for the full year. Um, one analyst over J.P. Morgan saying that the operational guide for the year unlikely to inspire much excitement. So that combined with that delay, really putting some pressure on the shares. And then we're also looking at another name in the defense sector, that is RTX. Those shares though, on the upside today, the company's fourth quarter numbers beating estimates. It also issued a better than expected full year cash outlook. Uh, the company ending the year with a record backlog boosted by $95 billion in new awards during the fourth quarter here. So this is a flip. I mean, it seems like the read through from some of these results is there is still strong demand for defense spending. It's just that Lockheed was sort of affected by that specific issue with the F-35, F whereas RTX doesn't have that issue and it's able to more uh, uniformly benefit from that demand. Yeah, if you look at, and just to your point, RTX, I'm just looking at the backlog here, 196 billion, and that breaks down, it looks like 118 billion from commercial aerospace, 78 billion from defense. I'm just looking at today's gain, it's now in the green this year, though still, it looks like we're down uh, over the past 12 months. Yeah. All right, and then shares of Plug Power finally ripping higher following news. The hydrogen tech company is closing in on a substantial government loan. So this one, Julie, was interesting. Obviously, nice move in today's trade. And it sounds like the news is that it's getting closer to finalizing this $1.6 billion loan from the U.S. government. And the rate won't be higher than it looks like 6.5% timeline should be finalized by Q3 and then apparently the company would then use the money to kind of support um, as many as six hydrogen production facilities. Yeah, I mean this is a company that back in November said it might not be able to stay in business. That's right. Yeah. So this is something that is raising some hopes that perhaps it will be able to. I mean when I see a move like this on a company that is not that large I also think to myself short squeeze and so yeah. I go and look up the data on short interest and indeed 27 percent of this company's float is shorted which is really really high. Yep. So yes, you probably are looking at 
a squeeze in addition to that fundamental news that we're seeing on plug power. Also some, and it just throws, it's not just the loan, but also mentioned the cutting spending. That was a big right. number they put out there too. Plans to cut cash spending by 70% from 2023. So taking steps there to strengthen the balance sheet too. Yeah. Earnings season is heating up. The market is expecting solid growth, but is it enough to come to grips with pricing in too many rate cuts? Our next guest thinks the next few trading days are huge in regard to answering that question. For more insight on the markets in 2024, we're talking to Global Investments Portfolio Manager Keith Buchanan. Keith, it is good to see you. So we were just talking earnings, uh, Keith. We're in peak earnings season now. We heard from the big banks. We got big tech on, on deck here. Keith, I'm just interested to get your take on this earnings season. What, what you've heard so far. Absolutely, and thank you for having me. Um, we start off the earnings season with the banks that's left some to be desired, but we're fundamentalists um, at our shop. We think the equity still trade and risk assets in general still trade on earnings and earnings potential. Um, coming into out of the earnings recession of 2022 and 2023, we really expect that 12% growth that's expected over 2024 and 2025 to really shine through the equity prices at 18 times which, where we were trading last fall. Um, coming into this earnings season, we're at 21 times after the recent rally. Um, so now the low hanging fruit has been harvested and we're looking at what could potentially push the market further. Uh, what unlock the potential for the market to see through the, that earnings potential and that growth that we're underway right now is uh, that the Federal Reserve um, didn't push back on the dovishness the anticipation of a dovish Fed throughout the course of 2024 and the Fed perhaps taking their foot off of the break, let the market see back through to earnings of what's driving stocks on a fundamental basis. For that to continue, we feel like that dovish just continues and needs to be pushed back. Um, but the earnings growth and that profile is still intact. We think it's a real a tailwind for markets at this point. So Keith, just to put a fine point on this. So in other words, there was this narrative that the Fed was going to maybe cut six times this year. And, and a lot of strategists that we were talking to were saying, they're not going to cut six times and they're not going to start in March. And the market's going to be disappointed when that realization hits. You're saying the realization was tempered, cushioned by the fact that earnings are turning out to be better than estimated? Um, actually, the, the expectation has been tempered from six cuts to now five cuts. But still, let's remember, economic uh, the dot plot put three cuts as the Fed's base case. So there's still a gap between five and three that has to um, you know, converge at some point. Um, but what we, how we look at the equity markets is the overhanging um, um, real negative sentiment was overwhelmingly because of inflation and the Federal Reserve's uh, reaction mechanism. Um, if that has started to go in more so in the rearview mirror, that gives the marketplace more more room to appreciate the earnings environment, which we feel like is extraordinarily buoyant coming out of the past five quarters. So we're talking earnings, we're talking Fed, Keith. I'm also interested at the rally we've seen. How does valuation look to you here? Uh, it looked a lot more attractive three months ago, mm -hmm. uh, 18 times. 22 times is, is not as attractive uh, from a long-term historical objective as 18 times is, but look, um, if, if, the, if the market is pricing in the growth of earnings, growth of cash flow, a lot of that depends on tech, which is why the next week is incredibly important to fulfill these, this optimism that's baked into bottom-up expectations for, for uh, the SP 500 to generate 12% earnings growth. Um, so we're really excited about the potential for that market to, uh, to really anticipate that in a more material way without the clouds of uh, the Federal Reserve monetary policy kind of overhanging the marketplace. And Keith, are you guys buyers of tech going into the earnings from those companies? We've been long um, U.S. large cap growth, and that obviously is, is centered around tech in a very meaningful way for years now. Um, it's uh, been a, a great tailwind for our relative performance and absolute performance. Um, right now, we're holding uh, steady with the exposure we have. Um, we are really cognizant of the optimism that AI has baked into some of the names that have had the best performance. So we want to make sure uh, that the way they get through earnings season is something that we're comfortable with on the other end. Uh, so we're not necessarily buyers uh, hand over fist right now, but we still have that long exposure. We're overweight and we're comfortable with that. And Keith, um, I'm interested within the banks, where do you see opportunity in that sector? Right, so coming out of last week, uh, all the major banks reported uh, we've been positive on uh, on the banks, um, at least within the financial space, for for uh, several months now. 
Um, JP Morgan is the best of breed there. It, it didn't disappoint on a relative standpoint this past earnings season. Net interest income uh, seems to be holding steady for JP Morgan. And we like the best of breed company uh, going into what could be a, a, a trough year for net interest income uh, in a way that gives them some upside from an earnings contribution standpoint uh, that we just haven't seen in several years. Um, now, does that unlock the valuation to continue to move higher? I see it to be seen, but the stability of net interest income, um, as well as the environment of a normalization of the yield curve, we feel like gives that, the, that group and that name some positive momentum. Keith, thanks so much for joining the show today. Appreciate your time and giving us some ideas of where to possibly commit capital. Thanks so much. Thank you. Coming up, how the 2024 presidential election could impact aid to Ukraine. More Yahoo Finance coming up on the other side. The latest aid packages from Ukraine's two largest financial backers are being held up by political infighting. The timing is crucial for Ukraine in its ongoing fight against Russia. The nation could run out of funding within months. That's according to officials, if additional support is not provided. Here to discuss the situation and more is Bill Browder, Hermitage Capital Management CEO and head of the Global Magnitsky Justice Campaign, longtime critic of Russia. Good to see you, Bill. Thank you so much for being here. Um, you know, we're talking about this as folks are voting in the New Hampshire primary. And I know uh, the people over in Europe in particular are watching the U.S. election very closely, um, both on the presidential and congressional end, to see what it's going to mean for Ukraine. What are you watching? What are you concerned about here? 
Well, there's two big things to be concerned about. Uh, the first is the short term. There is a, a 50 billion dollar, 50 billion euro aid package from Europe that's been held up by uh, Viktor Orban of Hungary. Your, Europe needs to make their decisions unanimously. He's vetoed the decision. And so that's blocking the uh, EU package for Ukraine. And there's a $63 billion um, U.S. aid package for Ukraine that's being held up um, by the far right of the um, U.S. Republican Party. And so in the short term, both those packages need to be unblocked. I'm pretty confident that, that both of them will be. I don't think that this is a permanent thing. But the, um, the big and long-term issue is, or I should say medium-term issue, is, is November 2024. If Donald Trump um, is elected president of the United States, he's pretty much committed to cutting off uh, U.S. funding for Ukraine. And if that were to happen, it would have a devastating effect on Ukraine's ability to continue to fight off Russia. And, and so, Bill, I'm just curious more in the near term, why, why are your reasons for optimism uh, here in the U.S.? We're on Capitol Hill. It seems like we've been having the same debate for a while here where Republicans are saying, listen, if there's going to be Ukraine funding, it's, it's got to be tied to border security. Well, I, I think they'll, I mean, I, I've, I've done a lot of work in Washington over a long period of time on the Magnitsky Act, and I've seen how the sausage gets made. And um, <clears throat> this is a high priority for, for the um, Biden administration to get this aid package released. And there will be a negotiation that will eventually lead to, to the package being released. I, I, I can't imagine a scenario where that doesn't happen. Um, it may be delayed. It may, <clears throat> it may um, come with all sorts of um, ugly... Uh, attachments, but I, but I can't really imagine a scenario where, where it just doesn't happen. Uh, similarly, with, with Europe, I imagine that they'll find some, some compromise. But um, if, you have, if you have the presidential, uh, the president saying, I don't want to do this, which is what Trump has said, that, that creates a much more dire scenario. And Bill, um, you know, I feel like at the beginning of this conflict, there were a lot of predictions that maybe this could you know, was sort of a chink in the armor of Putin's power. How, has it played out that way? I mean, what are you hearing from folks inside of Russia about how this is playing out amongst the Russian public and, you know, other folks sort of around Vladimir Putin? Well, we, we shouldn't forget that this war was supposed to be won by Putin in three days. He was supposed to be marching in with his, uh, you know, with dress uniforms and people putting flowers on the tanks, and that didn't happen. And we're now coming up to the two-year anniversary of this war. Putin has lost literally all of the original soldiers who started in, in this war. There are more than 300,000 dead Russian soldiers. They've lost 95% of their uh, tanks. Um, and, and the economy is, is in a state of disarray. They, they've reallocated resources to the military. And so heating systems all across Russia are blowing up, and there's people in desperate cold in Novosibirsk and other other cities, the Ukrainians are hitting the hitting Russia with drones and bombs in different places. Fires burning out of control in oil terminals, um, and then you have a, a, a million able-bodied young Russian men who have left the country. People, these are sort of the, the the best and the brightest who have left the country because they don't want to be decimated uh, as cannon fodder. And, and it's just not a good situation. Now, does it mean that Putin is going to lose power? I mean, we all look at this and say, how can he stay in power in such a situation? And the answer is that, that it's not a democracy. It's not, he's not in power because the people love him. He's in power because the people fear him. He's created a total repressive system. If you criticize Putin, if you criticize the war, you go to jail. If you're an opposition politician, you go to jail. And, um, and that's in the best case. In the worst case, you get killed. And so it's, it's, it's a total um, pressure cooker inside Russia. It could blow at any time or it could carry on for many years. Nobody really knows. It's hard to, hard to predict how a, how a country um, responds to this type of uh, adversity. And, and Bill, as, as someone who thinks critically about, about Russia and the government, the intentions there, when you think about Putin and his end game, does it end with Ukraine? Absolutely not. So, well, so if Putin were to win in Ukraine, um, which is more likely now than it was before because of all these financial uh, problems that Ukraine is having, um, he can't stop there. His whole purpose of going into Ukraine 
was not because he needed Ukraine or wanted Ukraine. His purpose of going into Ukraine was to create a foreign enemy, start a war, and distract any kind of anger that would there be towards him, towards a foreign enemy. And if he wins in Ukraine, he's got to keep it up because it's he's now in a sort of wartime footing. And, and they've said it very explicitly. Putin and other people have said it, that they're going to move on further west. And that means Poland or the Baltic countries, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. And if he moves west, um, then we have a much bigger problem than we have right now because those countries are members of NATO. And NATO is an organization, one for all and all for one. And that means that... Um, we then have to go to war with Russia. Or even worse, we have to then abandon NATO and let Putin take over the rest of Europe. Either way, it, you know, it's, it's effectively the beginning of World War III. And Ukraine is the one thing standing in, in between us and that, which is why it's so important that the money flows to Ukraine for, to let them fight it out um, without the single loss of an American life. Um, Bill, lastly, I, I want to, if we can, put all of this aside for just a moment. I am curious, you know, I know you're still managing family money, at least at Hermitage. I, I'm just curious where you're seeing opportunity right now as all of this is going on. You look at emerging markets. Are you seeing any good opportunities? Well, w one of the things I learned from my terrible experience in Russia is that rule of law is, is absolutely fundamental to any type of investing. And um, even though my, my entire career and my success was based on public equities and emerging markets, I'm now focusing very much on private equity in rule of law countries and developed markets, because that seems to me to be the place where I can sleep at night. And that doesn't mean that the, the prices are particularly good, but what it means is that um, when, you, when you look at a business and look at a situation, you know that whatever happens to your company and your investment, you get to keep it at the end instead of someone trying to steal it from you, which is what often happens in emerging markets and particularly happened to me in Russia. Bill, thanks so much for, for joining us today. Really do appreciate your time and insight. Thank you. And coming up, we're going around the horn and checking in on some of today's top trending stories. Stay tuned, more Yahoo Finance on the other side.
Hello and welcome to Yahoo Finance's group chat. It's an earnings day today. I'm Alexandra Canal with Josh Schaefer, Prosty Moranian, and we're kicking things off with taking a closer look at what we've seen from Netflix. Netflix reporting fourth quarter earnings also for full year 2023. We saw a beat on the top line, a slight miss on the bottom line, but it's really those subscribers that are standing out to me. Netflix adding 13.12 million subscribers, beating its own guidance of about 9 million. Now, this is pretty sizable considering where Netflix has come from. It's actually the biggest earnings surge since we've seen since the pandemic where Netflix was adding around 20 million subscribers every single quarter. And it just shows that you don't have to spend a ton of money in order to grab those subscribers as long as the content is there. We know Netflix is still spending a decent amount. They said they expect to spend $17 billion in 2024 on content. That's not nothing, but they were spending a lot more at one point. So I definitely think the subscriber story is an interesting the one. Subscriber story is definitely interesting. And just overall, I mean, what a quarter. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of metrics you can go through in this report that Netflix didn't impress you in. So the EPS, they technically missed the streets estimate for the prior quarter but they top the estimate for the current quarter. And then when you look at overall EPS growth, you're talking about $2.11 of earnings per share for the prior quarter. Mm -hmm. That's up from 12 cents yes. a year ago. Like that's a massive jump in earnings per share for a company. You have margins at 21% for the year ahead of their own guide for 20%. I guess sort of the, the point I'm making here, guys, is on a day when Netflix had kind of a splashy deal with WWE to start the day. Mm -hmm. Netflix is getting into live events. There's kind of, you know, that that castle in the sky, if you will, that you could be buying on when it comes to Netflix, but to actually see the fundamentals play out in the earnings story, I think that's why we're getting such a big jump in the stock. The investor story is quite attractive based on the numbers here. Yeah, I mean, this that subscriber edition is just amazing, right? As in the US, there's still people in the US getting Netflix, Asia Pacific region. I mean, just huge numbers there. And then also, you know this also, Ali, about how there's gonna be M&A in the industry, but we're not gonna do that. We don't care about linear assets. We're just going to they stick with, that. yeah, we're going to stick with investing in content, 17 billion worth. My only question is, and I, I was sort of poking around for, where's the gaming content? Is that going to be a big driver in the future, do you think? Or? Gaming was mentioned once in the release. Mm. Uh, it's still a part of their growth strategy moving forward. And analysts have said that that is an untapped opportunity along with live sports. We mm. were talking earlier in the program whether or not you could classify WWE Raw as a live sports event <laughs> or if it's sports entertainment. There's quite a debate we'll on that. Scripted series. Drama. Scripted we'll go scripted series. Scripted series Drama. is the Drama. official answer. Yeah, Comedy. but... But, you know, Josh, you were talking about the year over year comps and, and just to focus in again on those operating margins, because this is something that investors have been really focused on for a company like Netflix. They grew up from 18 percent in 2022 to 21 yeah. percent in 2023. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of this has to do with those revenue initiatives, the ad supported tier, the password sharing crackdown. I mean, I think that's why we're seeing subscribers jump so much because yeah, so people are converting. That was the last thing I was going to say on Netflix. It just stands out to me is. We're talking about gaming, we're talking about live events, and you wonder when they even need those levers to come in. Right now, it seems like the ad tier itself is working, right? Yeah. And the password crackdown is working. And I'm curious what we hear on the call about when they expect that to stop working. That's just kind of generally driving the growth here without even some of the other levers that we're talking about that are going to come down the line, right? Just that basic, okay, now more people need to get their own Netflix account, and here's a cheaper option available, seems to be driving more people to the platform. Like a pretty genius sort of uh, business strategy there, but mm -hmm. more on that later. Looking ahead to Wednesday after the bell, for me, it's Tesla. Tesla investors, fanboys, and the haters and short sellers eagerly awaiting what the company will report tomorrow night. Revenue expected to come in at 25.87 billion, a 6% jump from a year ago, with adjusted EPS coming in at 73 cents or thereabouts. Now, big things to watch here. I'm watching here the delivery target for 2024, price cuts, versus the profit debate and of course Elon Musk's pay situation you know I mentioned I mentioned that big sort of discussion there with what they're going to do with you know pricing and profitability that's, that's a margin question like you mentioned mm -hmm. with Netflix you know we might see a little bit of a, a bump up there in margins potentially finally a trough that's a big thing people want to watch for and then of course that Musk's pay package you know tweeting about how you want more control of the company 
Otherwise, he'll take the AI ventures outside the company. What he's talking about is he wants more shares. That's a compensation issue. That's a big problem if you're asking, demanding more shares, and you're on the board too. Yeah, we were talking about this during the break. It got me thinking about Disney because CEO Bob Iger, his pay has come under some scrutiny. And one of the main sticking points with this Nelson Peltz proxy fight is that Iger and members of the board do not have that much stock comparatively. <laughs> so apparently they don't have as much skin in the game. Wow. Now Musk wants more skin in the game. Right. So that just reminded me of yeah, well, what's going that, on. Is that what Peltz wants to hear, right? That's what Peltz wants to hear. I'm just fired up to see the stock action. Te Tesla's one of those stocks that's just always fun to watch on Newsy Days, and when you take a look at Tesla year to date, the stock's been awful. Yeah. The, the top yeah. 20 stocks yeah. have absolutely ripped and carried the market to start January. That's why the S&P's at a record high, and the one stock that has not helped that narrative has been Tesla stock. And I'm wondering, Pross, if we do get that margin trough, if we do see beats on the top and bottom line, what's kind of the reaction? When you look kind of broadly at the S&P 500, the reactions haven't been that strong for companies that have beat the average coming into the day with a little bit over 10% of the index reporting, so not a ton, mm -hmm. but you're getting beats of about 0.7%, or sorry, rises of about 0.7% if a company beat on both the top lines. And then if you miss, you can see pretty heavily scrutinized here, down 1.8% if you missed on both. So I think broadly, I'm just curious, investor sentiment, investor appetite, for what we know is a popular retail name in Tesla. So, so a few things, right? So the stock is down around 15% compared to the S&P up around 2% or so this year. A lot of the estimates for Tesla have been coming down as we go, as we enter mm -hmm. earnings. So there might be some, a bit of a surprise uh, to the upside there, potentially, mm -hmm. right? Stock down a lot, earnings estimates have come down, maybe they can beat there. But if you see some good things, talking about Cybertruck, talking about uh, AI initiatives, talking about the margin trough, the, uh, surprise, we're gonna get that 18% gross margin. That Those are the catalysts that can move the stock a lot higher. Look at Netflix and, and Tesla, very similar. They move a lot of earnings. The next day move is what we need to watch though. What do you think is the biggest catalyst? Like what do you think investors really want to see in this report in particular? I mean, I don't think we're gonna hear, but if Musk says we're done with price cuts, we're done with that, we're good where we are right now, we're gonna focus more on profitability. The margins. Yeah, mm -hmm. we're gonna get a probably 2.2 million 2024 delivery target, which is a bit l lower than what we think that they want to, you know, based on their 50% CAGR rate, you know, but it might be better for them. More right. profitability, not so much volume. Don't sacrifice profits or volume. All right, Pross going to be looking at those fundamentals. I just want to hear if the Cybertruck's getting a price cut, so maybe we can get in on that action. <laughs> but I don't know if that's going to be happening quite yet, guys. Up next, we're going to bring you what to watch tomorrow. We break down the top stories you need to know to start your Wednesday.
Let's take a look at what's trending after hours. So we're talking Texas Instruments. The company's numbers missing, in particular revenue estimates in the first fourth quarter. The first quarter forecast coming in lower than Wall Street est uh, estimates as well. Texas Instruments, the largest maker of analog semiconductors. Now, these are sort of the simplest type of semiconductors, but TI also has the biggest range of customers because its semis go into so much different stuff. And the company is saying on its conference call that the industrial market market in particular has worsened here and that the outlook is showing a weak environment. That's reflected in that forecast for first quarter revenue. Yeah, as you said, I mean, folks really kind of watch this thing because its chips go into all these different verticals. So it's autos, it's industrials, it's consumer electronics. And so they kind of look to TXN as okay, the TXN instruments is kind of a possible read into the health of those, those end markets. And that's, I think, the money line here from the CEO. During the quarter, we experienced increasing weakness across industrial and a sequential decline in automotive. The stock had a nice pop heading into this print since early November, but you can't, since he has sell, sell off here in the after hours and basically has gone nowhere in the past 12 months, Julie. Yeah, nowhere in sharp contrast to what we have right. seen from semiconductors more broadly. I mean, the Philadelphia Semiconductor Index was up something like 65% last year. TI was up 3%. Yeah. Yeah. So it's it's been it's been underwhelming and underperforming for a little while here, and it looks like there's nothing in this report, at least at first blush, that is making investors change their tune. For sure. All right, time now for what to watch Wednesday, January 24th, on the earnings front. More reporting from Tesla, ASML, IBM, AT&T, and ServiceNow as earnings season ramps up here. Anos looking at IBM as an undervalued stock going into 2024 with the boom in AI. Tesla, meanwhile, slumping to start the year. Company continues to cut vehicle prices as electric vehicle supply outstrips demand. And moving over to the economy, new monthly purchasing managers insect index data measuring the direction of economic trends and manufacturing. That comes out tomorrow from S&P Global. Uh, services and manufacturing PMIs both expected to take a slight dip in January. And finally, tune in for another episode of Yahoo Finds His Goodbye or Goodbye tomorrow at 3.30 p.m. Eastern, where we help navigate the best moves for your portfolio. Really good. I think, feel like you should just do the voiceover for that now. I feel like yeah. you're really getting good at that intonation. I feel like that could be, here. maybe that's a, sort of a year-end bonus yeah. I discuss. I, I like mean, The it. way I'm selling it, frankly. I like it. I, I think it deserves something. I think it does. <laughs> I I give you all the credit. Um, let's talk about, let's kind of zero in on a couple things. I'm watching for Tesla tomorrow. I think it's really interesting what Josh um, mm. Schaefer was pointing out earlier, that of the MAG-7, this is the one that has not done well uh, this year. It's also interesting that even Adam Jonas over at Morgan Stanley, who is a long-term bull on Tesla, says the market is oversupplied versus demand and that the company's outlook for this year is going to be cautious on volume and profitability. Price cuts, margins, compensation for Mr. Musk. Yes. All big themes. Yeah. I am watching Julie IBM. Mm. Big blue. Yeah. Reporting tomorrow, some big themes here. Um, one is you always look for execs uh, on on the call to talk about the macro, the general IT spending environment, and also more specifically for IBM, what they have to say about AI, mm -hmm. kind of the contribution that's making to overall results, both now and in the quarters ahead. Evercore recently upgraded IBM, Julie, to outperform because they argue it's an overlooked way to invest in the broader AI theme. Um, so it'll be interesting what they say in the call. They also expect IBM to initiate 2024 guidance tomorrow, and they say the outlook for annual free cash flow that's really the key bogey the street's going to focus yeah. on. I mean, just to be specific here, IBM has been in AI for a long time, mm -hmm. but generative AI mm -hmm. is something that is new to it and And underappreciated, according to Evercore. Maybe so. Yeah, all we'll right. See. That'll do it for today's Yahoo Finance Live. Be sure to come back tomorrow, 3 p.m. Eastern, for all of your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell. Have a good one.